guys, GT here and welcome back to the channel. Today happens to be a very special day for this channel as I'm honored to be joined by a very talented guitar player, a fellow Australian, a fellow musician and a fellow YouTuber and a very good friend, Mr. Leon Todd. Now, Leon doesn't need any introduction whatsoever. And in fact, if you're on my channel, you pretty much know who Leon Todd is. But in the rarest of cases, if you don't know who Leon Todd is and you're a guitarist, you're clearly missing out on a lot. So go to his channel and show him some love. I'll link it down in the description box below because he's been doing a tremendous amount of good work for the community by putting out XFX lessons, tutorials, presets, gear reviews, original music, guitar lessons, and plus he makes us laugh from time to time. Overall, a fantastic dude to hang out with. Make sure you check out his channel. Now, I had the privilege of meeting Leon back in March when this whole pandemic wasn't a thing and I met him for his first ever FM3 workshop in Melbourne. Uh, he was touring with his band Ragdoll at the moment. Extremely, extremely fun time. I wish we could do this in person again, Leon, but unfortunately we are limited by the tools of our technology at the moment because travel isn't such a thing anymore at the moment. But hopefully we should catch up soon in person again. Okay, enough of that. I'm gonna stop rambling. I've got a set of questions prepared for him already. Some of them are tough, some of them are easy. So let's see how he handles them. Let's jump into the call right away. Hey, so Leon, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an honor to have you on the channel. It's, uh, I wish we, we could do this in person, but you know, the times, the way they are at the moment, we are kind of far away and uh, have to use technology to our best. So how have you been so far? I mean, I know it's been a long time since this whole thing started. How, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm just very fortunate to be from Perth, I guess, uh, our kind of situation is out of everywhere in the world, probably one of the best at the moment. So yes. yeah, I cannot complain. How are you? Because for, I guess for <laughs> anyone watching, people don't know Melbourne kind of opened up a bit and it went back to a very hard lockdown, right? Yeah, we still and under stage four lockdown, I am allowed to go five kilometers uh, within my house, which means I can't give my guitar for repair, which is around 10 kilometers away from me, the Luthier. So I'm waiting for the next date is on 19th of October when they announce hopefully stage three. But, you know, right now I'm just, we just tired of waiting for this thing to get over to be honest it's, well, been, it's been since march you know it's, it's been a very very long time i'll cross both my fingers yes. and my eyes for you man i really hope it <laughs> improves there yep me too me too yeah so i've got a bunch of questions kind of jotted down for you and uh if you're okay we can just go through them one by one and, let's do uh, it should be good yeah all right so let's start with the i think the uh the most awaited question that i think everybody has uh, that you've had the Fractal FM3 for a while now, probably like more than six months. I think when I met you in March, you had just got it a couple of days back. What are some of the pros and cons you've encountered with the unit so far? Yeah, I would say I got it right before we, literally the day before we went on an Australian tour, which at the time was, you know, cool. I've got this new thing and it does everything that I want and it works, so I'll take it. And that kind of became the Corona tour because we got back home and we did a show and then like we did the last show of the tour and that was probably the last live music for several months in Perth. So that was, that was kind of weird. So the, the good thing is I've had a lot of time at home with it, dialing it in. We've been fortunate where we've been able to play a couple of shows again and I've used it for that. Uh, it's, I mean, the pros are long and I'm sure most people know what they are, but just the fact that you have such a compact and powerful and portable floor processor is really attractive to me. I can do everything that I need to do live with it, which is awesome. Uh, I guess the only, only drawback with anything is it's a new product, you know, and if anybody who's owned either an AxeFX 3 or an AX8 or an AxeFX 2, there's always so many changes and so much rapid development with fractal products when they come out that, you know, I've just been, I've just been updating, you know, going through and anytime you update firmware and you have a whole bunch of new things to try out. If you're not a 
tweaker and you're not into that kind of thing, I can understand how some people can be frustrated with that. But uh, but otherwise, it's been pretty smooth sailing for me. It's it's really worked well, and it sound, most importantly sounds amazing. Yep, yep, and uh, we've all heard you play a lot of stuff on the channel with that. So yeah, it's, it's an amazing sounding unit. I actually played a little bit of it when you were here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, it was it was sounding pretty amazing. That workshop was very 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 inspiring and very killer to be honest. Uh, really had a lot of fun. All right. So, what is your daily routine like? You know, please give us some perspective around how you manage to publish a new video every day. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of puzzles me. <laughs> well, I just don't have a life. That's the secret to it. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm really fortunate where, when, and especially the last six or seven months, I've probably been busier than I've ever been uh, teaching online. That's been one positive thing on my end, even though it's weird saying there's a positive thing when the whole world is burning, but I teach, so I teach guitar from home and I, I mean, I've been teaching guitar since I was like 16 years old. Uh, so that's just kind of what I've always done. So the video thing was a very natural, I guess, progression for me because the way I do videos is pretty much the way I teach. and my setup at the moment is really efficient. Uh, that's, I guess, the main secret to it. So yeah. I can record, if a video is 10 minutes long, then it takes me maybe 10 minutes to set up. Let's say it takes me, I try to do everything in one take. Doing one take videos is easy to edit, but sometimes I'll sit there and I'll get halfway through a take four or five times and you know start chewing my words or something like that so in, re in reality most of the time it takes me at most an hour to produce a video so that's you know seven or eight hours a week that's not a massive commitment of my time and a lot of the time it's just me doing what I would normally do with that time but I've got the red light on and yeah that I mean that's just been kind of the model that works for me and I always have this gigantic list of videos that I want to do. And it's kind of the only way I can do them. I, I said at the start of this year, I'm, I was going to try to move to like three videos a week. And that lasted two weeks. And I just ran, I just had too much stuff. So, so it's a, it's, it's about efficiency. And I just really like doing it. I, I can understand that some people uh, who do produce content can find it, that it can become a chore, but it's not so much yeah. like that for me. So I, it fits around what I'm doing anyway. Yeah, I remember I was standing next to you in uh, in a bar where you were about to perform with Ragdoll and pop comes a notification on my phone that Leon has just pushed a new video. Then like, how is that possible? He's standing yeah. next to me. <laughs> so that was that's that's interesting because any time I've gone away or gone on tour, I I basically double that schedule so that I've got videos scheduled and you know, there's videos that come out uh, sometimes that I've shot months in advance where they yeah. just you know I'll I'll schedule them for a week and then I'll be like oh you know there's some other new thing that I bought or there's a new firmware for the Axe FX I'll I'll do that video now because they're a little bit more kind of time sensitive yeah and that happens like three or four times where there's been videos I've done which have been really fun videos but they just kind of been crammed uh into the schedule so yeah I'm I always try to stay a couple of days ahead of of schedule with things that's pretty awesome because for me for me i think planning a video is like almost uh, a lot of preparation because uh, i have to first you know set up the whole thing because i don't keep my stuff set up all the time because yeah, yeah, right. i have a five-year-old kid running around so <laughs> i have That'll to do manage it. everything Anyways, that's 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 a very good perspective. So you get up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee. Ha I think you're teaching as well, and then you straight away head into shooting stuff, or do you shoot in the night before and then you edit in the morning? How how, how is that process? Yeah, so for me, normally my my wife gets ready for work in the morning, and normally I'll start right around the time she leaves for work. I'll normally have a few online sessions in the morning, and then kind of that like you know midday ish zone is normally when I get all my work done uh, with the videos and it's normally like shoot, edit immediately, upload kind of thing. So unless it's a every like unless it's a very specific structured thing, I will jot down notes 
So I just have this big notebook of like video ideas and, you know, kind of points to hit sometimes. But a lot of the time it's just verbal diarrhea on my end and I just kind of go, I just fly by the seat of my pants and, and see what comes out. That's awesome. But brings me to the next question, like what are some of the other things that interest you, of course, outside of guitars and music? Lots. Yeah. So it's, if some people have seen my channel, they know that I have a, uh, like I've had a previous life as a, as a failed academic. I did uh, an honors degree in mathematics and physics, which awesome. I finished and I was, I very much had that kind of crossroads moment where I literally the day I handed in my honors thesis, I had, that was like the first ever kind of jam session I had with the ragdoll guys where we were like, are we going to do this thing? Is this going to be a band? And uh, yeah, I initially sort of went, okay, cool. I'll, I'll take a year and see how this thing goes. And, you know, 10 years later, here we are. I still, still haven't gone back, but uh, I love cooking. I kind of cook every day and yeah, just kind of every day. I, I call it civilian stuff, you know, uh, you know, cooking and, uh, I love I love coffee, so I've, I've, that's been my latest absolute nerd rabbit hole that I've gone down. I have a lever machine now, and all this you know, it's super super du duper nerdy. I should probably start a coffee channel. That's that's even more <laughs> down the rabbit hole than guitar stuff. And uh, I mean, they they bought out a new Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game. It's like a reissue of some yeah. games. So I've been playing that a lot, um, and. Yeah. Other than that, like, you know, like music and guitar kind of is my hobby as well. You see, you've been into skateboarding as well. I follow you on Instagram, yeah. so I've seen you doing a lot of stunts. That's pretty good. Yeah, it hasn't. I haven't done much of it because it's been winter here. So, uh, you know, all the parks, it's kind of kind of rubbish. And but yeah, I kind of got back into that at the end of last year. And again, it's been a weird thing. Skate parks have been closed and few other things like yeah. that so yeah you know i'm i'm just kind of i'm one of those people who if i'm not doing something i go crazy same with me yeah. i'm those kinds as well yep. all right here comes the big one what is your philosophy on tone is it really in the fingers or does expensive gear really make you sound great that's a very very interesting question that i don't really have a super strong opinion on because you know, both are kind of important and that's a boring answer. I think people, <laughs> you know, it really is. It's, you know, it's, yeah, you can get a Squire Strat and a Boss Katana and gig with it. That is something you can do. It's totally possible. I know people who do it and they sound pretty good. And it just depends on really... Really, the main thing is most of us, you know, guitar is this kind of passion project first and foremost. Even people who play for a living and they play every day and, you know, you see guitar is an interesting thing where it's like, you know, if you watch, say, Tim Pierce's channel, uh, you know, absolute professional of professional guitar has been his living and his career. But he's so into it still, as you can see that it's not really a... A job to him it's it's his passion project and he's been able to monetize it so i think as guitar players we always have that uh that layer on top of it where it's like we're kind of doing it to really please ourselves and in that case that's where the gear comes in because you know it can be frustrating to use a piece of gear that feels like maybe it's limiting what you can do and i don't mean that in like oh well you know i only have two channels on my amp uh there's definitely that aspect of you know as guitar players we should really approach it from that playful perspective like you know the way a kid would play with a new toy like they you know try cram it in the toilet and see what's ha what happens or they try you know like you've got a five-year-old you know what i mean where it's like i'm sure you spend a lot of time going that's not what you're meant to do with that thing but yeah but that's where cool stuff happens. And, you know, getting a piece of gear and to me, a good piece of gear has a lot of, hey, it wasn't designed to do that, but it does it kind of applications. So uh, good, good gear is versatile. And often that's what, yeah. you, that's what you pay for. And good gear is reliable. And that's another thing that you pay for. 
But Absolutely. I think I'm, I'm, I'm completely in alignment with you because for me, I think I used to play an Ibanez Geo, G-I-O, yeah, right. I think, which was a pretty basic low-end sort of a guitar. And I always used to have this excuse, you know, I don't have great gear, so I'm not a good guitar player. And then I think in 2014, I bought the first JP6 that I ever owned. It was the early ball music man. Yeah, nice. And then I was like, wow, this should be phenomenal. It should change my entire planning. And I still sounded like shit, to be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> And that's when I realized that, you know, I need to work on it. You know, it, it's yeah. not just the gear. It's Yeah, yeah so. it's and I, like I said, it's a boring answer. It's both. And, you know, to me, I... I, I Definitely, like, there is such a thing as, like, bad gear. Bad gear will put an upper limit on how good you can sound. But at the same time, uh, I mean, one of my favorite YouTube channels is a guy called Kevin Heydrich. Uh, he does these, like, incredible playthrough videos where he plays an Ibanez Geo. And it's like, you know, he's down-picking Master of Puppets at, like, 270 BPM, uh, which is a pretty clear demonstration that, okay, cool, you know, yeah, that's a cheap piece of gear, but it, just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's good. Exactly. It's it's to me it's it's more about you know as you said maybe you get a really nice piece of gear and almost it's almost so nice that you feel like you have to up your game to to respect it or something like that. Uh, exactly. Yes. But at the same time, you know, I I, I often think it's like I've done, you know recordings and gigs some of the stuff that i'm most proud of with you know gear that's maybe a little bit just kind of it's not the highest end thing out there you know like it's a marshall dsl and a stock les paul or something and um, it sounded it sounded great i think back to my original point it's it's kind of you know the threshold for say rock music for sounding good it's actually so low that it's almost universal now like you can play anything and sound fine um so that's not really part of it. It's then what you do with those things. Yeah, actually, yes. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I think that kind of brings me to the next question. How many guitars do you have? Please uh, give an exact count. <laughs> it's, it's more than 30. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's about as far as I've got with it. And, and you know, to be honest, it's, it's, it, when I was, you know, in my late teens and early 20s and, I had way more disposable income. I didn't spend it on cars or beers or anything like that. I literally just bought guitars. Uh, and that's not something I do that much anymore. So yeah, all the, the crazy stuff that you see is is mostly a function of being, you know, in my early 20s and teaching a lot and being in a position where I was gigging and earning money. and. Uh, gear being cheap it was this kind of like perfect storm for somebody who likes to collect things um and that's that's why i mean i probably play like you know six or seven of them really really regularly but the rest of these you know that's that's my vice i don't drink i don't take drugs i you know i don't collect cars or anything there are there are far yeah. worse things you could do Absolutely. So that we know the black PRS SC245, if I'm getting it right, is your favorite one. We've seen it so many times. Yeah. The Which one do you play the least out of the lot? That's a good question. Uh, that's a really, really good question. You know, honestly, uh, for, for people who aren't aware, my dad's a guitar player and he uh, used to do a lot of building as well. And he built a replica of a Gibson Double 12. So not the EDS Jimmy Page double neck. Uh, we're talking about the 1958 double 12. Really niche piece of piece of gear. I think and, I've seen that one. You've done a video of that on your channel. I think I've seen it. Yeah, it's easily the coolest thing that I own. But it's also probably the guitar that I play the least. Just because, you know, when I sit down with it, it like covers up my face. It's so big. Um, <laughs> and I should I should play it more. Uh, and But the reality is like, yeah, that's probably the one that Unfortunately, I play the least just because it weighs like, you know, 12 kilos and it's yeah, just this monolith of a thing. It's, uh, it's, it's so cool, but you can play it for five minutes and you're like, man, I need to, I need to put this thing down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine standing and playing a gig with it. It's like, oh bad. my gosh. <laughs> and you know, any, any, any time I chat to him, he'll often say, he's like, ah, oh, you know, man, you gotta, you gotta pull that out for a gig one day. People lose their mind. It's like, yeah. And I'll probably like lose my ability to stand. 
plus with all the uh, stunts you do on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should be it, fun to watch. <laughs> I, I can't I can't do aerobics with that guitar on. <laughs> yeah, aerobics, yes, that's the right word. <laughs> Sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> anyway, so if if you if you had a daytime job outside of music, what would you what would you be doing? Again, great great question. This these are awesome questions. I, I like the I like this interview. <sighs> You know, I, like I said, my, I went to university, I studied maths and physics and those kind of things. It would be, it would have to be something with people because I think that's part of the reason I play music as well as it's inherently a social thing. My wife does care work and the older I've got kind of the more I see the value in something like that. So I could definitely see myself doing something like that. Or, you know, I would be a crusty academic sitting in a room writing obscure math equations all day. Uh, that That's probably the other the other end of the spectrum, the other part of my personality that I'd delve into. Uh, but it, it is, it's, uh, you know, it, it's hard because I just spend, it's hard to think about that stuff when you spend so much time, so much of your free time as well, just noodling around on guitars. So it's like, well, you know, this... It's not, it's, yeah, again, it's not something I've, I've been fortunate enough not to have to think about, you know? Yeah. But perhaps teaching maths as well, that could be a good thing to do. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I've, I've, I've done in the past as well is, is tutoring. And it's something, something I really like. And it's a good example of breaking down, you know, seemingly complicated ideas into discrete edible chunks. And when you're, Talking about guitar gear, sometimes it is like that. It is very technical and involved, and you need to not dumb it down, but you need to, I guess, translate those technical terms into something which people actually have experience with. Yep. So yeah, you, me, me, and you both, I think, uh, perhaps more you than me, have been sitting down and dialing in tones for hours and hours yeah. and you perhaps are playing the guitar more than probably I do ever do but you know we all know that playing it for long hours can not so can be tiring and not so good for the hands and the upper back to be honest and I've gone through it myself so you know please tell us some of the exercises or best practices that you follow for maintaining the hand and back health yeah again that this is something that people should talk about more and you know, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor or a physiotherapist or anything, so I kind of don't feel too comfortable talking about this. It's in no way anything I know anything about. But, you know, when we're... I really, really, really did some bad things to my back early on as a player just from my posture was very, very poor. And I still watch videos of myself. I'm like, man, you're, you're slouching and, you're, you know, your shoulders are hanging in the wrong position. I think that... You know, if you look at like a classical guitar position where you hang your guitar on your left leg or something, having your shoulders yeah. as level as possible is really important uh, to, to avoid those things. And one unfortunate quirk of human anatomy is that all the things that send signals into your fingertips uh, flow th over your shoulders into your neck. Yes. And that's often where we, we either lean or we put pressure on or we put guitar straps on. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, you can get those kind of compounded in injuries. You can get repetitive strain injuries. It's a, it's kind of like a I whole have a bit of it. Yeah. Me, me, me Sorry. too. Probably for me, it's using a keyboard and editing videos, uh, has, yeah. has done that. So I think it's, I think everyone who probably, you know, calls themselves a musician carries some kind of injury, but for me, it's, uh, it's just outside of that, you know, spending some time, you know, working out or I try to go for a walk every day and actually get outside and get some sunshine and, and, and those things. And it's kind of the mental thing as well. You know, it's very easy to, to get obsessed with things and, and having activities that you do that aren't all music is really important. Even if it's cooking a meal or playing a video game for half an hour or something uh, that, you know, looking after your mental health is as important as your physical health. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I think, uh, for me as well, I type code for a living, so I'm pretty much on the laptop or on the keyboard yeah. most of the day, just like you. So I know I've, I've been going through it myself and posture is a really, really important thing. And as you grow old, like, you know, I'm pretty old now, so you realize that, you know, that 
improper posture can really do harm in the long run. So yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple of your favorite things. Let's see that these should be pretty quick ones. So if you had to choose a favorite pedal, which one would it be and why? Can I give you two answers for that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Can I break the, the the explicit rules of the question category? I think <laughs> that's absolutely fine. I think one pedal everyone should have is a Boss Super Overdrive pedal because I just love that you know yellow little thing that you put it in front of an already dirty amp and it sounds better. And then if you have a clean amp, you can get nice boutiquey drives, and they're cheap. So Boss SD One. Absolutely love that thing. Uh, the... I, I got one of those. Uh, sorry to cut you there. Yes. I got one of those as part of that Jam Like a Boss Challenge. Yeah. So that's awesome. sent me an SD1. Yeah. How good, how good is that? Uh, the other one's the Eventide H9 uh, because it does everything. Uh, it only does yes. one thing at a time, but it kind of does everything. So uh, those two are at opposite ends of the pay scale, so to speak. But uh, yeah, the, the H9, I mean, if you could only have one pedal, it would probably be a good one to have because it's a great like Swiss Army knife, yes. I guess. If you had to choose one clean chord for an entire song, which chord would it be and why? All right, I'll, I'll, I have to play it, don't I? So we're gonna, we're gonna do one chord, what? See this guitar, it's just, it's got a tuner in it, but it's not in tune. So I'm going to I'm going to nominate this chord which has a very again I could give you two answers for this uh but I'm going to choose this one most people will know it as the rush chord uh but its technical name is F sharp 7 at 11 it sounds like this Is it the Alex Lifeson chord? You know it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds because you know it's a seven chord, but it's got some, it's got some, X, it's got the eleven in there, so it's you know, it, you, it's kind of vampy. Uh, the other one would obviously be E seven sharp nine, the Hendrix chord, and um, fun, fun story about that. I'll put my guitar back. Uh, I used to do this gig with two buddies of mine, maybe ten years ago, uh, and it was like a three set cover gig, and there was never anyone at the venue, and we, <laughs> we kind of triple dared ourselves to see if we could play Hey Joe for 45 minutes. And we did, we did a whole set and it was a continuous jam of just that song. So I probably played that chord 400 times that night. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, I think the first one you played is probably one of my favorites too, because I think Petrucci uses that one a lot as well. Yeah. Not exactly the same one maybe, but yeah, I think he uses that one quite a lot as well. Moving on. So, if uh, what's your favorite amp to play on, and why? Yeah. Okay, so for this one, just one, one, one choice, not two choices for this one. <laughs> just one choice. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll give you a just a solid, solid one choice amp. You know, I would have to say, if I could only play one amp again, it would have to be my Soldano Hot Rod, because that amp kind of does one thing really really well but the thing that it does is such a great thing absolutely i agree with you i was thinking i was hoping for that answer yeah it's, and it's, thank you for it's awesome that. It, and you know you can you can kind of dial it in to do a, more of like a crunch thing it's got some clean sounds in there it can kind of do the rectifier thing as well but uh yeah it's just a really glorious sounding app yep yeah, yep yeah, i i completely agree with you i haven't played one to be honest, I the only amps I've played through is a Marshall. I haven't even played through a Mesa, to be honest. And the XFX has really, really opened my horizon to all these wonderful new amps. But yeah, hopefully someday I get to play on the amps as well. <laughs> hopefully one day you can come here and play mine. That would be a fun oh, thing to do. That would be awesome. Yeah, hopefully this pandemic thing gets over and we can all travel again. Yeah, yeah big should, time. We should definitely catch up. That would be awesome, man. Thank you so the, much. The offer's on the table. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. What's your inspiration to start a YouTube channel and how do you keep the motivation going? It was very much a happy accident. I kind of got into it. I'd done a few videos for a friend of mine. Uh, shout out to Johnny at Anarchy Audio, uh, who makes some amazing handmade pedals over here in Perth. And uh, we've been buddies for a long time and he custom made me a pedal a while ago. And he asked me, 
oh, I can't remember, this would have been like 2008 or something, like he had a new fuzz pedal coming out and he asked me to demo it. So I just kind of did a little, I didn't know what I was doing, but I he came around and filmed me playing and we pulled a few tones and kind of mic'd it up and I thought that sounded pretty cool. And then it was sort of like when I got an AX8, I just did a few videos which were like, you know, AX8 sound test. I had, had a GoPro and uh, I, there was a lot of things that I wanted to know about it that weren't online. So I kind of figured those things out the hard way and then I started doing videos with them. So yeah, and that just kind of spiraled out of control and, and here we are. And as for, <laughs> I should answer the second part of the question. As for motivation, uh, you know, it's just, it's just part of my weekly workflow now. It's something I don't really think too much about. And, you know, I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy doing the videos. So that's pretty much the motivation. I think if I ever stop enjoying the videos then I'll probably stop making them. That's awesome. Yeah, I think enjoying it is the most important thing. On that note, I want to congratulate you in advance. You are really, really close to 50,000 subscribers. <laughs> That's awesome. I remember when I found your channel, it, I, you were around 25,000, which wow. is pretty huge. And uh, you know, please tell us how it feels to know that, you know, close to 50,000 people are watching your channel. I don't think the human mind is designed to properly contemplate like those kind of numbers so it's i don't know it's it's a it's a weird thing that that many people would like what i do enough to press a button but then again you know you think about it there's the the incentive to press a button is it's like well it's literally a no cost thing i use the small amount of energy required to click and then i get essentially free infotainment so uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's awesome. I, I really, really feel lucky and privileged that people keep tuning in, uh, cause I like doing yeah, videos. I, I, I wish you, I wish you a million subscribers really soon because you've been doing absolutely phenomenal work for the community. And, uh, I think I enjoy every single of your videos. Well, thanks. Uh, some Thank of you, them, man. I, <laughs> some of them I'm not able to follow as much because I don't probably have the same gear, but the, you know, some of the ones where, you know, where you, I especially remember a couple of them where your wife was playing the guitar from the back and then you had that guitarist plays a jazz solo or something like that, but you didn't play a single note. Yeah. That was hilarious. I just probably fell off my chair. That's, <laughs> that's so probably my finest hour as a musician because I didn't make any noise. So go me. <laughs> And there was this other one where you were, I think, uh, pretending to be at a booth in uh, Nam. I think you had multiple shots of yourself talking to each other. Yeah, and there's, I, you know, the, the comedy aspect. I, I always just kind of think, you know, no one's going to do better than K-Mac or Jared Dines or anything doing the, doing the funny stuff on YouTube. It's, but every now and then I'll just have a stupid idea. It's like, you know what, that's going to take me five minutes to make. I'll, I'll do it and... And if someone gets a laugh out of it or a kick out of it or, you know, makes their day a little less miserable, that's kind of the nice thing about YouTube as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, if, if yeah, people, I, I, as, like as it, a right. YouTuber, I can confirm that, you know, being comical on channel is very, very hard at times. Doing comedy, to be honest, is very, very hard at times because I've tried doing it and I fail miserably. So, <laughs> well, I, I, I really appreciate that content. No, yeah, thanks, man. All right, so uh, talking about your band, Ragdoll, what has been the best gig that you've ever played uh, so far? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, again, multiple multiple answers depending on, depending on what lens I view it through. Uh, I always feel like you can play really well at gigs that where you're playing to three people in like a dive bar in the middle of nowhere. And you can have gigs where you're playing to, you know, a few thousand people and they're going mental and having the time of their life. And the whole gig you're going, oh my God, what is wrong with me today? I just can't play. Uh, and I've definitely experienced the former of those extremes, probably a lot more than the other one. But uh, I would probably say a big highlight for me was we did a festival in the States called Rocklahoma a bunch of times. And the last time we played there in 2016, we, the way it worked out, the side stage we were playing, we ended up playing after the Scorpions. So the Scorpions were the main headliner 
and we were the last band to play that night uh so it was sort of like everybody saw the scorpions and they just kind of wandered over to our stage to sort of check out what was going on and it was a really nice night we we it was the first big gig i did with my axe effects ultra as well which was kind of cool uh, there's footage of it online and a lot of people being like, oh, what what Marshall is that back there? What are you using? It's like, well, that's not plugged in, that little box on the floor. Uh, so that that was just just a really just a really fun one. You know, we got to play last and we had a bunch of bunch of people who had seen us previous years came out, a bunch of new people, and we had the new album out and people bought a lot of merch and yeah, it was just a really, you know, on, on, it was very like satisfying on a lot of levels. Uh, another one that comes to mind is we did uh, we did a festival in the south of France uh, uh, same year. Like we we toured the states and we toured Europe, and we started the gig probably at like you know half an hour to it was like a twilight slot. We got the best slot just by luck. And when we started, the sun was just starting to go down and, you know, it was such a beautiful evening. And by the time we finished, it was dark and they had this big laser show happening. And yeah, I, I just remember that being a really pretty gig and a really beautiful gig. And the the crowd was, uh, you know, it wasn't huge, but they were really, really into it. And, you know, by the second chorus of every song, they kind of picked up what the, what the chorus was and they were singing and... Uh, then we just got looked after really well too. You know, they had, they had all of this nice food for us and it was a, that was a real kind of, that was a treat, that one. Yeah, interesting you bring that up because I think that's a very good component of a good show for me as well. Like hospitality from the event managers yeah. or from the campus in, in case you're playing in a college or something like that is really important because if you're not treated well, you're pretty much not in a great mood on the stage as well. And you don't connect with the audience that well. I think it's very important. That's a very good point you bring up. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, for me, like I've probably done more gigs, you know, in a slightly kind of pissed off mood than, than not just because of that, you know, like there's always, there's just always stuff that doesn't go according to plan. So, you know, no matter how, how much you plan something, you know, something can blow up or you can be late without realizing it or, you know, something cannot be there that needs to be there. So uh, <clears throat> I try to do as many gigs as I can now in a good mood. Yep. So talking about Ragdoll, I mean, uh, please talk about the songwriting process in your band. You know, can you walk us through as to how you write a typical song in Ragdoll? Yeah, it's... I, I would say there's not a typical way of doing it, but the reality is, is I, you know, I have my setup here. So if I have an idea... Normally I'm noodling around a guitar and a riff pops out. Uh, I will just track that little idea, you know, quickly program some drums and uh, record the riff and then put some bass on it and kind of store it away in my little vault of ideas. And the really good ideas are the ones where I start doing that and I'll be like, okay, cool. That's a fun little riff. And then I'll immediately be like, oh, I've, I've now got an idea of what I want to do with the rest of the song and I'll sit there and I'll kind of flesh out an arrangement really quickly. So yeah, my, I, I have the ability here with just, you know, literally an axe effects and some guitars and uh, pro tools and like a drum plugin. I can, you know, do decent enough sounding demos where I can arrange a song, have the main ideas in there. And then I just email it to everybody and if I hear back from somebody, if they say, hey, that was really cool, then I know that idea is really good. So, and they're, and they're the ideas that we'll work on. So, uh, yeah. And then we normally kind of shortlist material that we want to work on and we'll get together in a rehearsal room and just kind of forensically deconstruct the song and then rebuild it part by part. And if ideas work, they work. If not, then we'll, we'll kind of just rinse and repeat that process until we get something we're happy with. And then I'll often bounce around kind of basic vocal melodies and, uh, you know, get Ryan in here to, to sing stuff. We've been, we've been doing a little bit of that over the last couple of months where uh, when he's had the time to, to come in and we've been basically just kind of rewriting a couple of songs we've been working on, like redoing the, the lyrics and the melodies. And he and I will kind of sit down and just flesh out some ideas. And then, you know, I'll, I'll sit here and hit record and, throw ideas at him and he'll uh he'll do what he does which is sound great singing and yeah and then and that's kind of the process and then we'll we'll go into the studio and we'll just kind of knock it out 
Yeah, that's awesome. Because, you know, the melody line of every song is probably the first thing that hooks on to people. I think for guitar players, it's the guitar riff. Like for me, for me and for my five-year-old son, like when Shine comes on, like, you know, when I play Shine on the phone or probably on the computer, he sings it note to note and he's really fond of that melody. And it's absolutely gorgeous the way the song starts. And Ryan has a killer voice and when the guitar parts kick in, it's like that down palm muted kind of a thing that you're doing. It's it's really fantastic. And plus the solo, it's 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 amazing. It's I, a, that's I, one of my favorite songs, to be honest. Thank you, man. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, we, we kind of have a joke with in the band that like, you know, we should have beat, we should do kids music because uh, I don't know what it is. Like a lot of like Ryan's kids really like all the stuff we do. Uh, young kids that I teach, if they find out I'm in a band, I'll show them my stuff and they'll be like, wow, this is this is really cool. So maybe maybe we're just in the wrong industry and we should be writing, you know, <laughs> we should be like that heavy metal version of the Wiggles or something. That song was interesting because I recently found a demo of that from 2013. That was the first like incarnation of that song. And I we did a short little vocal demo of it and it ended up on my on my phone for just like living there for a couple of years. We didn't end up using it. We were writing for an EP, didn't end up getting used. And then when we were putting Back to Zero together, literally the last song that got put together was Shine. And I mean, it's like a cliche. You hear this all the time. It's like, ah, oh, the first song on the album was actually the last one that we wrote uh, because it needed that kind of big bombastic, opening song and we had toured the states the year before and when i was on the plane back you know it's like a 17 hour plane flight from dallas to sydney or something you know i listened to every podcast and every album on my phone and i just watched two movies on the plane and still there was like eight hours left you know um i I know that feeling yeah yeah and you're just like ah get me out of here and I was just looking through my phone. I was like, oh, I got this, you know, and it was like untitled track two or something. And I was so (laughs) bored that I hit play on it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about this. And I was listening to it. And the arrangement was really, really different. But the vocal melody was there. And I was like, oh, that's, yeah, that's a pretty cool vocal melody. I like that. And I just kind of sat there like humming it to myself in my seat. And then you know the the wonders of boredom i i had this idea i was like you know we should we should do something with this song we should really we should rework it and i was like i don't like anything except the vocal melody so i I just kind of sat there and i had you know the little uh notes thing in my phone and i was like okay cool what could you do with this vocal melody And i was trying to imagine the arrangement in my head and then i had that idea of like oh what if we just have the singing at the start and a big build up and then So I I got really excited on the plane where I was like, okay, cool. I started sketching out the song in my head around that vocal. And I think I ended up writing at least like the the vocal melody in the verse as well. Kind of like being, okay, cool. I'm going to rewrite lyrics around this. Um, And we ended up changing some of them by the time we ended up recording it. But that was that was like a good example of kind of an unconventional thing where this this song that I had forgotten about kind of got rediscovered and then totally re, like I literally got home off the plane. I was like, I need to I need to find this session on my computer. I was like manic and <laughs> jet lagged and I need to just like knock this arrangement together. Uh, and yeah, we ended up doing it. It's kind of I think the song that most people associate us with now. Well, that's an awesome track. I, I think that now hearing the backstory behind it, I think you did a good thing by not leaving it out. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 weird how these things happen. It, it at in you know 2013 it wasn't the right time. It needed a few years to marinate and actually uh you know get fleshed out. That's awesome. I've got a final question for you which is kind of related to what we're going through right now. So if this pandemic has taught us one thing, what it is according to you? <sighs> Ooh. Uh, you know the 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 and not to sound negative but i don't know if it's actually taught us anything uh on, as a as a collective i think it's uh, but 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 that is probably a lesson in itself so that's a it's a weird paradoxical answer 
Uh, I think in Australia, the way it has been handled has been uh, like I've been mo it, mostly it's been handled very well here and uh, especially com com compared to a lot of the world. But I think one thing that I've kind of realized, and this was a really, you know, an, an unpleasant process and an unpleasant set of thoughts to have to go through, which I think a lot of people have gone through is, uh, you know, we, we often overestimate the amount of agency we have in the world. This is a really heavy answer. I know, like, <laughs> you know, uh, I, 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 I could, could give you the, the G rated version, which is like, ah, oh, that we all need to come together and, you know, be no. good to one another. Um, I think, I think if anything, this has kind of shown that like, yeah, you know, the amount, like we, we overestimate how much agency we have in the world, meaning that a lot of the things that are good in our lives are just a product of, of, you know, like us being lucky enough to live in a certain place or, um, I have certainly realized how fortunate and how privileged I am um, in the world at the moment. And that that is not a universal thing. And that, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of the problem with the world in a lot of ways where, you know, I have all this stuff and com compared to the rest of the world, I'm really wealthy and I have a lot of time to myself. So uh, it's, it's really, it really is not fair that that's not the case for everybody, you know? Um, but on that you know, I'm. Uh, I, I will say as well on that issue of like uh, agency. Uh, it has made me realize that you can't spend your time on Earth worrying about the things that you can't control, and that if you focus on the things you can control, uh, in general, you will. You'll be. You'll be happier. Uh, you'll be more fulfilled, and the relationships you have with people around you will be will be better. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe it's made me realize that like, I thought I had control over all these things, whereas in reality, maybe the only thing I can, tr can control is, you know, uh, how I choose to interact with other people. So, uh, yeah, I just try to choose, you know, kindness and decency, and they're the important things that we need more of in the world. And all the other stuff often is just, I guess there's that kind of element of uh you know th yeah there is there is bad stuff in the world and um sometimes you you can't control it no matter how hard you try so try not to do any more you know d just try to try to remain not bad maybe that's my message and i i get i get that that's a total downer as well <laughs> i i kind of get agree to your point as well i think for me as well i feel privileged and blessed, I think, in the same time that I'm able to still work from home and still have a job, whereas so many people are not having a job at the moment. Can't even possibly imagine how difficult life is for people out there. But at the same time, I kind of, uh, you know, I, th I think I kind of asked you the same question when I met you back in March, you know, because we were just starting off with this whole thing. It was March and it was not that serious at the point in time. But I think uh, you had pretty much the same answer back then as well, that, you know, we should focus on things we can control and things which are outside our control are pretty much, you know, you can't do anything about it. So, you know, why worry about them? It's, yeah. It's, I think a very good answer. Yeah. And, you know, it is really, it's a, it's a, it has been, we, it's, it's uncomfortable to live through history, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's really easy to, for anyone to look back and go, oh, when, when all this stuff happened and, you know, we will prevail kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's ho hopefully, you know, I'm, I am, I say all these things, I am really hopeful. Hopefully the plus side out of all of this is that um, if it can be brought under control, that people can realize the utility in, in looking after one another, you know, in, in that having, you know, for example, in Australia, we more or less have universal health care uh, where that's that's not available in other parts of the world and that you can have those things and you can still have, you know, freedoms and rights as a, that there is a balance between that, that you don't have to, uh, you know, be crushed by totalitarianism just to have, 
the ability to go to the doctor and not, you know, become destitute or something. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and and that's uh, again uh, kind of a heavy answer, but that's that's really been where my mind's been at recently. And uh, I will say though that there is hope because I live in a place where. Um, you know, the pandemic has mostly been put under control. We haven't had any community transmission for for months and things are opening up and people are happy and healthy and we're able to go and kind of live our lives. And, you know, it the, the sacrifice is, is worth it to, to return to yeah. that kind of new normal kind of thing. So uh, it things things will change. That's that's that really is. If, if anything, it's a um, that hope is not unfounded, I guess. I completely agree with you. I think uh, we have to I think me and my wife were talking the other day about it as well. We have to adjust to kind of live with it because, you know, things like these have happened in the past as well. And as we all know, history kind of repeats itself. But we as a, we as humans have always kind of adapted and kind of, you know, took the right paths towards coming out of it. And I think, for example, here for us wearing a mask and going out is a really important thing. And I, I, I still see some people who don't do it, but you know, for us, I think if we follow the rules and if you follow the rules and stay safe, and as you said, be good to one another, yeah. I think we can come out of it. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, definitely. And you know, it's, I think, you know, we're both musicians and most of the people watching this are musicians and you know, as musicians, where you just the fact of playing music, you have to do it with other people, and sometimes it's it's a good way of uh, you know learning how not to be selfish as a player and making the musicians around you sound better. Uh, it's that's a really we already have that attitude in place a lot of the time, so you can take that attitude to your direct family, to your community, and that's the thing that's powerful about music for me is that those those practices that maybe we take for granted as as players can actually have a positive effect in the community yep i completely agree with you i think music is a very powerful healer and i think it's always helped me come out of very difficult situations in life Big anyways time. Uh, i think it's getting a little too heavy for yeah. everybody <laughs> feel feel free <laughs> thank to, you so much for that feel free to edit that out if if anything else <laughs> it's taught me it's like maybe i've just been a rubbish person in the past and uh that you know to be a human being first and a musician second rather than the other way around no i think i think the, whatever you said i completely agree with it and, and i think uh, everybody should hear uh, your opinion on that as well because these are some of the things that you know, people don't usually don't talk about, and I'm very, very thankful you answered that. I think that's pretty much all the questions I had for you. Awesome, man! Thank you. That was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. It was great to catch up. Yeah, it was a real privilege to have you on the channel, and uh, as you said, I you know probably look forward to catching up with you in person again, big time, and uh, hopefully jamming uh, a little bit more than what we got to do last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if Yep, and uh, again, I wish you all the best and uh, hope to see you soon at a 1 million subscribers or probably even more. <laughs> oh man, it's, it's, all, it's all gravy from this point. I'm just, I'm just happy to be here. And, and again, thank you for having me and thank you for everything you do, man. It's I, I, watching your channel and you know, getting to become buddies with you has been an inspiring and a really satisfying experience for me as well. I mean that. Stay, stay away. I mean, I'm, I'm so, so privileged that I, you know, I have you on the channel because to me, to be honest, being in Australia, I don't have too many new friends here because I moved here recently. And to be friends with you, I think it's one of the most uh, wonderful things that's had, that has happened since the time I moved here. Uh, so thank you so much for awesome. that. And thank you always for your support. You've always been very helpful to me and to the entire community. Thank you so much, Leon. Thank you, man. Take it easy. Cheers, talk to you soon.